Good afternoon, my name is Allison Palmer. I'm one of the student leaders of APSA, and it's my pleasure to introduce our 2018 Lasker Award winner, Sir Peter Radcliffe. Dr. Radcliffe is a physician scientist who trained in medicine at Gonville and Caius College, Cambridge, and at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London before moving to Oxford to specialize in renal medicine. His work on oxygen sensing has won a number of awards, including the Louis Jeannette Prize in Medicine, the Canada Gardner International Award, and the Lasker Award for Basic Biomedical Research. He was elected to the Fellowship of the Royal Society and to the Academy of Medical Sciences in 2002. He's a member of EMBO and a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was knighted for services to medicine in the New Year's Honors in 2014. In 2004, he was appointed Nuffield Professor of Clinical Medicine at the University of Oxford and served as head of the Nuffield Department of Clinical Medicine from 2004 to 2016. In May 2016, he was appointed Director of Clinical Research at the Francis Crick Institute, retaining a position at Oxford as member of the Ludwig Institute of Cancer Research and Director of Oxford's Target Discovery Institute. And with that, help me in welcoming Dr. Peter Radcliffe. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a great honor to be here, uh, a Brit coming to the home of the physician scientist. And I'm very grateful uh, to the Alaska Foundation for the support to do so. Um, that is the story I, I want to tell. Now, as I was preparing the lecture, um, my secretary came through the door I just must have looked a little bit hesitant. Perhaps it was trying to fit it in with the theme of healthy aging. She said, you should look at the videos of the previous speakers. She usually gives good advice, so that I did, and I learned a lot. They were very interesting. Um, Mike Brown uh, spoke about prizes. Um, amongst other things, he pointed out um, that they're really an afterthought, that the real joy um, and motivation is in the discovery uh, per se, pure and, and, and simple. And um, with all respect to the Alaska Foundation, that is, that is surely correct. So I, I thought I'd uh, share some of those moments with you. Um, five of them, I think, uh, from my lab. You might call them Eureka moments. Um, but Mike also pointed out that, um, at least in biology, these moments are generally not flashes of brilliance. Um, what I'm going to show you from my lab is the chaotic coincidence of pieces of information from all sorts of sources, uh, the bad fortune, the good fortune, which eventually uh, cleared uh, to give one of those insights. Um, in this context, I'd like to paraphrase the great educationalist Abraham Flexner, uh, who many will know, who famously wrote this essay on the usefulness of useless knowledge. Uh, I want to talk uh, about um, the usefulness of incomplete knowledge. Uh, both descriptors of knowledge are fundamentally flawed, of course, since knowledge builds on knowledge, um, never useless, uh, rarely complete. Um, but of course, um, we now uh, hear a lot about this um, in two surprisingly different ways. Our funders, they're concerned with useful knowledge. Our editors, they're concerned with complete knowledge. And we'll come back to that in, in a way. But. Um, I was asked to say a few words about, to the young people about becoming a physician scientist, and I'm often asked to talk about the, the, the subject. Um, actually, I know nothing about it. I, I didn't know how you become one, <laughs> nor was it my intention. Um, th this was my intention in the 1980s, how to become a, a National Health Service consultant nephrologist with a salary. Um, 
Now, Mike Brown, um, in his talk on prizes, uh, alluded to the enormous success of a cohort of US physician scientists uh, at the NIH in the 1970s, which he partially uh, attributed to avoidance of the Vietnam War. This was not my problem, um, but it was connected, avoidance of something. What I was trying to avoid was a fate worse than this, uh, becoming an NHS consultant nephrologist without a salary, <laughs> uh, which was a, a clear possibility, as we were told there hardly any jobs, and one had to distinguish oneself in whatever way. And um, of course, the way to do that was to observe on, on the medical wards and write up what you observed as case reports. Um, much denigrated now, and if someone uh, proposes you for something like the, the last uh, award, then there's a tendency to adjust the CV so that you know, these things are not quite as prevalent in front of the jurors' minds. But, but I'm going to defend them. Uh, the case report attempts to draw a conclusion from a fixed data set. That is important. You cannot change it. A fixed data set. Now, in my lab, as in many, there are people who will go on and on and on and on and on doing experiments. It's necessary to come to a conclusion. And um, that, I think, is the merit of the case report. It's a different skill, a complementary skill, uh, and important skill in your um, scientific uh, career. Now, I wanted to show you one of my case reports. Um, this is um, the spontaneous resolution of, of anemia uh, in long-term uh, hemodialysis patients. And um, this is due to the spontaneous resumption uh, of erythropoietin production. And I'd like to say that at this moment, with crystal clarity, I foresaw uh, the inhibition of the prolyl hydroxylase oxygen sensing system uh, as a treatment for renal anemia. <laughs> the, the observation is connected, um, uh, but of course uh, life is more complicated and I ambled around the clinic thinking of all sorts of things to do. Um, I, I wanted um, to understand the susceptibility of the kidney to shock um, that failed. I wanted to understand myoglobinuric renal failure. That, that failed. Um, and um, uh, eventually I came to this. Um, I wanted to understand the extraordinary precision by which the kidney sets hematocrit. And um, I thought uh, that it um, had something to do, this is what you do with EPO when you donate a unit of blood, extraordinarily precise. I thought it had to do with this unusual oxygenation gradient in the kidney uh, due to the countercurrent uh, multiplier. Uh, and I wanted to study that in the perfused kidney. Uh, those experiments also failed, um, but they led um, uh, to what we really did, um, the attempt to move at a molecular level and understand the molecular process of oxygen sensing, which we thought was embodied in some extremely special cells within the kidney. Now, there is a second issue in becoming a physician scientist. You need some technical skills, and people say, well, you should go away to a powerful laboratory and learn some science, and then you can come back and apply it in the clinic, and I'm not absolutely sure that that is true. I am going to suggest an alternative. What you need is a friend with a laboratory. <laughs> um, I went to see Sir David Wetherill, and he was kind enough to let me into his institute, but not into any particular laboratory. And it was John Bell who took me in. Uh, John works on the genetics of HLA. Uh, and was kind enough to take me in. Now, this avoided the risk. There was absolutely no risk of joining all those people who wanted to understand the interesting problem of HLA genetics. 
Had I done so, I'd have joined the hundreds or thousands, and I'd been one of all those people. I wanted to do EPO to oxygen. I stuck with that. So that's what you need, a case report, and then a friend with a laboratory that'll take you in and help you do what you've decided to do. Um, John, um, in fact, uh, suggested this experiment. Um, we, we wanted to, we need to get those cells, and to get them, we, we wanted to grow them, and this was the expression of T antigen uh, embedded within the EPO gene. Uh, it um, didn't work. Again, it didn't make an EPO of OMA, and we couldn't get the cells we wanted. It, it, it did mark them um, as the interstitial fibroblasts. Um, interestingly, um, Leon will hate this, the most boring cell in the kidney, I think, or at least uh, the only one of many that had not been proposed to make EPO. I'm going to argue it is the one that does it. It's unspecialist, and in retrospect, that should have been a clue for what was to come. Now, I, I said I'd get on to those uh, eureka moments, and um, we uh, proceeded, actually, uh, Franklin Bunn had set up a hepatoma cell culture. Um, uh, this is the liver, it makes EPO. Uh, the physio had some, some reservations because it was liver, not kidney. Uh, but this is, this is our work uh, identifying the uh, three prime EPO enhancer by transfection into Frank's cells. So that was the first step. Uh, Greg Semenza did this in the human gene, as with Jaime Caro. Uh, rather nice, neat uh, uh, first step in the journey. Uh, was it a eureka moment? Well, not, not really. Um, uh, we uh, had hatched an idea in Weatherall's famous coffee room that the, it might not be true that these cells were absolutely specialized. And this experiment would allow another possibility. What would happen if we express those sequences in a different cell? Might there be a general oxygen sensing system? That would be very exciting. Uh, Chris Pugh joined me in the lab, and uh, some people who know me and Chris will know that Chris is a rather patient scientist, and I'm a rather impatient one. So Chris did the experiment, and I was pushing him. Uh, he transfected the non-EPO producing cells at low density, and they didn't sense oxygen. He did it again in a different cell. Again, I was pushing him, low density, didn't do it. Well, there you are, you can't win them all. That was a nice idea. Um, and I went off, uh, then my idea was to do a clever experiment. They were copied off uh, Joe and Mike. Actually, we wanted to do an expression cloning experiment as has been done in the cholesterol sensing pathway and transfer uh, the uh, property of oxygen sensing from one cell that had it to one that didn't. That would be a good idea. So we wanted to check that the one that didn't have it really didn't have it. And this was me doing the tissue culture, so it was done a little sloppily. The cells got overgrown. And, well, we saw the oxygen sensing system. What was going on? Probably the density of the cell is important to create the hypoxia. Patrick Maxwell came to the lab, and uh, Patrick rather beautifully cleaned this up, showed that it was indeed uh, relevant to have the cells at the right density, and that's Patrick's work. Now, we were very excited. This was a eureka moment, the first of the five. And we wanted to publish it in one of these high-profile journals. So I actually took the manuscript to Nature offices. I hoped to break into their office and explain the importance of the work that they had seen through that. And after about three months, we got a response with a very positive review. And uh, I spoke to the editor, and I tried to persuade them. We didn't need any more reviews. One positive, that would be enough for me. <laughs> Uh, but, but, of course, it wasn't to be. There were two more reviews. They were adverse. And one of them said, well, Frank Bunn cells, we knew they weren't the real thing. They came from liver, not kidney. So this must be artifactual. And the other said, well, really, uh, this is a transcriptal system. They're mainly generic, so yours won't be any different. And um, I can remember the conversation. And the editor, he said, you know, this is just one experiment. I put the phone down, 
Of course, that concluded the possibility of acceptance. <laughs> now, in, in Oxford at the time, when you got into trouble like this, the one thing to do was to get into David Wetherill's office and stay there until he had done something helpful. <laughs> Which he did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the first bit. Um, um, of course, the editor was right. Um, uh, th this was okay, but then the implication was there were other targets. What were they? Well, we looked at some obvious uh, candidates, again, rather impatiently, the angiogenic growth factors. The probes didn't label on that day, so we missed that one. But I was still working on that expression cloning thing, and now I wanted to make some mutants and compliment them. Um, I was having a lot of trouble with the resistance, with the, the cell surface markers we were using. So I wanted to check the resistance marker, neomycin. Was it really being expressed? And I assayed it by RNAs protection and noted hypoxia regulation of the resistance marker. It's very odd. Might that reviewer have been correct? Was it, was it nonspecific? Couldn't understand it. Then uh, we looked at the plasmid that bore the resistance, the neomycin gene. It said PGK neo. I wasn't immediately sure what PGK stood for, that it's phosphoglyceric kinase. So um, we, we looked up um, Daryl Graner's papers on this. This involved opening the Journal of Biological Chemistry, where it had clearly never been opened before in the Institute of Molecular Medicine. Uh, and we got out the promoter sequence, and by now uh, Greg had identified HIF, and we were looking uh, for HIF binding sites, and we went through that promoter uh, and found uh, the uh, HIF binding site. So that was the first non-HIF, non-EPO HIF binding gene that corroborated widespread sensing, but that, it was quite difficult actually, and at, at that time the U.S. Uh, cavalry came to my aid in the form of your chairman and next speaker, um, Ben Ebert. This is Ben, uh, circa 1993, I think, Ben. Uh, he's not much changed, as you see, over 25 years. He's got a lot of tissue culture pipettes here, did a lot of work. That, that was a paper. Uh, and we had a great time, um, all sorts of things, very productive. And I counted nine primary papers from that time, Ben. And the last one was rather uh, funny, uh, the Drosophila one. Th this had the distinction of being lost by the journal, uh, editor of the Journal of Biological Chemistry and then rejected. No normally this is a great journal, but that wasn't uh, a good experience. Anyway, um, Greg um, uh, identified the, the, the cDNAs for EPO, uh, and that, of course, uh, enabled the next stage. I, I'm counting this as the second uh, Eureka moment, so we're halfway there really, just about. Um, and what we wanted to do was, was uh, see which bits of the HIF uh, interacted with the oxygen sensing system by splicing them onto all, all transcription, uh, artificial transcription factors. And we, we can see this type of assay, which um, uh, led us to conclude, that several people did this, Frank, Greg, uh, Jaime Carroll, this was our work. Uh, we identified three regions. Uh, they worked, some of them through protein stability and some of them uh, not through protein stability. I was very proud of that distinction. It involved titrating the plasmids and very difficult things. And um, we focused on this bit. We, we chopped it down. And uh, since everyone knew that signal pathways were regulated by protein phosphorylation, everyone knew that, we, we would find the phosphoacceptor. So we moved, mutated everyone, made no difference. So this wasn't a eureka moment, at least not in the eyes of the editor uh, who ex eventually accepted that manuscript. Um, what was it? What was going on? Um, so this was the next eureka moment, the connection to VHL, von Hippel-Lindau and uh, 
this, this is a gel was done by Patrick Maxwell that shows rather beautifully uh, that in the VHL negative cells, HIF is stabilized, and in the positive cells, uh, it, it's uh, regulated proteolytically by oxygen. So I told you these things don't happen out of the blue, and there was a history to this one. And other people had taken the transcripts that Ben and I and others had shown to be hypoxia regulable, and they found them to be upregulated in VHL defective cells. There are several groups, Rick Klausner, Bill Kalin, Orthon Aliopoulos. Mark Goldberg told me about this. He was in the oxygen study. He told me on a rainy day in Sheffield in the north of England. I can remember that. And I went straight back to Oxford to do the HIF blot. Must be HIF. There you are. Actually, that wasn't the blot. It was a later one. That was the blot. <laughs> Completely blank. And no doubt others had seen the blank blot. We went back on those genes, and we had lots and lots by now. They're all regulated, all upregulated. What's going on? But of course, all sorts of bits of knowledge coming incompletely from different directions. This was the next bit. People were sequencing the human genome. There were HIF paralogs proposed. But of course, we didn't really know whether they were functionally paralogs. With, regulated by protein instability. So we made an antibody. I don't really know why the academic community does not insist on everyone making antibodies to every protein. It would be really, really helpful. Anyway, this was helpful to us because we had the only one. We made it uh, to what was said to be a paralog, and indeed it was a paralog. Uh, Steve McKnight called it EPAS, but it then became HIF2. And that was the antibody that led to the discovery. Actually, there was, was a different cell. Most of the cells, uh, RCC, renal cancer cells, only express HIF2. This one express HIF1. So is that a coincidence? No, we'll come to that. The, renal, the VHL defective cells only express HIF2. Well, that was an important experiment. It connected HIF to cancer, to RCC, and Others have followed that. We still don't know the whole thing, but there's a great new drug from Peloton based on the important work of Rick Brewer, Kevin Gardner, Steve McKnight. But for us, we, we wanted to, uh, to get to oxygen sensing, and uh, the, the, we were able to show the complex VHL uh, had been said to be a ubiquitin ligase, and we were talking about proteolysis, so that was terribly difficult to put together. And, uh, we moved on to look at what it was that would promote the interaction with the VHL ligase with HIF. This involved a bit of biochemistry at which we were not massively skillful. Um, as I said, you shouldn't enter a big field. This was a small field, so it didn't matter to be not terribly skillful. Uh, we did all these things, um, the usual biochemical things. One was very difficult. One puzzled us. Cobalt and iron chelators that mimic hypoxia broke the interaction, but couldn't show that hypoxia did. Very odd. And then we realized it was necessary to exclude oxygen from the buffers. How to do that? Well, I was quite slightly overfunded by the Wellcome Trust. They were very generous. And a rep had come uh, from a firm called Baker Ruskin. They were selling at enormous price a huge cabinet in which you could do all these things. That enabled Panu Yakla and David Mull to repeat the immunoprecipitations anaerobically. And, and that gave the answer. We, we did all sorts of other things. We did mutations. We did mass spec. And then, uh, the important experiment, we made a peptide with hydroxyproline. And there it is. It no longer needs uh, the interaction with cell extract to promote uh, binding with VHL. And that's what I call a Sunday morning experiment. That means a postdoc rang me with the result on Sunday morning. It's very unusual. It means um, unusual for the UK. The experiment was done on a Saturday. <laughs> 
It means, secondly, it was considered sufficiently important to read on a Sunday morning. That's unusual. But really unusual, it means the result was positive. Usually they come in miserably on Monday, tell you the result. That's the, that's the fourth Eureka moment. That was, uh, that was uh, Yamin uh, and uh, uh, Sunday morning. Now, th this work um, was published back to back with uh, similar work from Bill Kalin. Um, and um, on this occasion, we're a bit more fortunate. Uh, one of the reviewers said it's premature, you haven't got the enzyme. Uh, but the editor, Paula Kibertsis, thank you, Paula, overturned that, and, and we were okay on this occasion. It, it was important and informative since, uh, of course, it implied a prolyle hydroxylase. They're oxygen splitting enzymes. They were known in college in biology, and they're known to be inhibited by cobalt and iron chelator. So what was the enzyme? Another piece of good fortune, at this time we met up with Christopher Schofield, uh, working in Oxford also. Chris was working on antibiotic synthesis, an important thing, but not of obvious relevance to oxygen sensing. So what was the link? Well, these were the enzymes that he'd uh, identified. They have this uh, beta barrel jelly roll structure uh, and Chris was able to make predictions that this was a large enzyme family uh, that might contain other prolyl hydroxylases in the human genome. I spoke about antibodies. We'd also identified the C elegance protein and made an antibody to that. So very quickly now, uh, this was Chris's suggestion. One of the genes he suggests was one called Egel 9. And there you are, the wild type and the Egel 9 mutant. That's the fifth Eureka moment. I can remember Andy Epstein bursting through the door saying, this is your gene, Egel 9. And uh, so, so, so it was. So, so there we are. Uh, that's what it is. Um, uh, hydroxylation of proline contained in alcohol group, which hydrogen bonds to VHL, destroys HIF in the presence of oxygen. And that's the switch. Complete story? I, I, I doubt it. Um, but I want to finish um, with a few thoughts about drug discovery and Darwinian evolution, uh, which I'll explain uh, by reference to the European motorway system. This is HIF. It's a basic helix loop helix pass protein. All sorts of reviews were said, written about the nature of the oxygen sensor by all of us. They were all wrong. Uh, no one, every iron protein in the textbooks was proposed except for this one. The more erudite the reviewer, the more wrong they were. You would have thought people were deliberately trying to retard the field. <laughs> anyway. Um, the, the, this is what it's made of, um, basic loop helix, they're in all eukaryotes, um, plants, animals. Past, they're in all uh, phyla, in prokaryotes, where they're sensing things, uh, do oxygen sensing. So how could it be that the past domain, which everyone said wasn't the oxygen sensor? Then um, we've come to the next bit, the PhDs, the prolyle hydroxylase, there's in uh, all sorts of... Uh, of species, but only assembled in this way in animals. And then there's another one that I haven't talked about, asparaginal hydroxylase on the C terminus. So that's Darwinian biology. You're pasted together in a hopelessly baroque, illogical way, which makes the discovery process so difficult, which is presumably why uh, Mike said that it was rarely a flash of brilliance. And to the truth is, I don't think it helps. It's almost a hindrance to be terribly clever. The analogy I'd like to draw is for the junior, for the young people, to that European motorway system. Now I know this is America, but some of you will drive uh, in in Europe, and um, you'll notice a difference between the German motorways and the French motorways. In Germany, Stuttgart, you're driving to Dusseldorf. Stuttgart is on the right, the big side. Stuttgart. You read the map, you read the sign, you go to Stuttgart. Intelligent, helps to be clever, helps to read. But um, I have the for good fortune to have a house in the south of France. This is the motorway in the south of France. A very nice place, and there are better things to do in the south of France than build motorways. We're driving along here, um, 
from, from Nice to Cannes, and Charles Le Pen is down here on the left. They exit the motorway on the right, you go up into the forest here, around these roundabouts, under the motorway, over the motorway, under the motorway, again, over the motorway, and then you go and find Charles Le Pen. You won't do that with a map. It's only done by prior and error, mostly error. So what's the reflection with Darwinian biology? Well, that's how it works. You're pasted together. In the south of France, they paste the roads together from existing little bits, which is why they're so illogical, so difficult to understand, and so difficult to make drugs against, which I'll come to finally. This is... Um, uh, the HIF pathway it has all these reflections, hundreds of thousands of genes, uh, and now we want to make drugs against it. We would like, of course, to isolate one bit and make the drug against that one bit. Different types of drugs, there are two really good ones, the Peloton, they're trying to uh, make a new type of drug against a transcription factor for kidney cancer, that looks good. Several companies are trying to make hydroxylase inhibitors to enhance HIF. So how could you do both at once? How could you ever make a drug against erythropoietin if you've got all these other things that you can't isolate? You can't have what you want. But this seems to be the result that rather remarkably uh, it's possible to enhance hemoglobin. Several companies doing this with little effect uh, other than the induction of erythropoietin. To quote the famous song, you can't always have what you want, but if you try, sometimes you get what you need. The famous words of Sir Michael Jagger and Keith Richards. Now they knew a bit about drugs. <laughs> and... Um, so this is the wrap-up. What do I want to say? Well, the first astonishing thing is those, those EPO-producing cells. As per the original case report, they don't seem to be killed off in renal disease. There are more fibroblasts in renal disease. Notably, the EPO-producing ability, when released by the hydroxylase inhibitor, is possibly greater. And here are two rationalizations. The first, the red cell half-life, 100 days. If you just push a few red cells into the blood, they stay there, an integrator. And that uh, famous countercurrent uh, mechanism, as you become more anemic, there's an amplifier. The cells in turn switch on and make EPO. So you amplify the cellular response massively. A drug does, is agnostic to that oxygen gradient. A little bit of drug can take it all. So I'll finish there uh, with that uh, explanation. Now, I've got three things out of that. The first, I hope some of you will agree that I've been very clever in that explanation. I think some of you, they'll be the nephrologists who know about these things and say, you're wrong. But the factual uh, thing is, this is a post hoc explanation. No one understood how this might be at the time the drugs were being produced. So in the words of the song, you have to try to get what you need. And I think that's the most important aspect of drug discovery. There's a level of empiricism. You need shots on goal. And let's hope this one's good. And I'll stop. Uh, there and uh, acknowledge all the good fortune I've had to work with these people and thank you for your attention.